Um, so, we usually like to start, of course, by welcoming you. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's been really interesting to see, um, you know, since I've been, I've been in Zurich for the last uh, 10 years as well, and so to see, well, about 15 years, so to see when Impact Hub started in the early days and how that has evolved and grown, it's, it's been an amazing journey. But let's go back a little bit further before that and, um, you know, to like start off with uh, where you come from personally. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? Born and, and raised in Ruhrgebiet. Do you know Ruhrgebiet? Rural area? West, west of Germany. Industri very industrial area. Mm -hmm. um, spent the first 20, 22 years or so there. Um, and and not, not much of entrepreneurship in my, in my family or background. So when you, when you were a kid in school, you weren't selling candy to your classmates? Or? No, not these, not these <laughs> stories. No, I was, I was only in sports, I think, all the time, playing soccer on the, on the field outside. And mm -hmm. I, I, that's, that's true. I, I, actually, I, 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 I was one of the first ones to buy actually a CD burner. You remember when those were still <laughs> and, and, and I did make money off that. So I, I sort of refinanced the purchase, uh, the, the investment by uh, burning CDs. I don't know if it's really on That's legally outdated already. <laughs> And, and um, as you were growing up, what did you, what were your childhood aspirations? What did you think about um, as a, that you wanted to become as you grew up? Um, well, that's, I think that, that that went from kind of the normal uh, German young boy dream of football player or <laughs> professional to. Uh, I mean, definitely never entrepreneur. Like, I didn't even know the term existed or so. In well, did you think you wanted to have your own employees and run your own company? No, I had no concept of such. My parents are both, or were both teachers, so mm -hmm. for, like, school was a major part at, at, at home or so. And only my older brother and sister, who went into large corporate, mm. like, showed me that there are actually large companies. And then, of course, I also wanted to go to a large company. So, but, but really, I mean, I was I was always quite ambitious um, at school and also like uh, pushed to be ambitious. Yeah. Like, uh, I uh, I still think back of having all these vocabulary trainings or so from my mom checking my Latin vocabularies. I mean, what that good for today? Like I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, so ambition was there, but but mostly channeled to just, just get the good grades to keep all the options open, not thinking mm. about what I really want to do, and that the rest was just sports and probably party and exploring. Know, growing up, um, and uh, when when did you come to Switzerland? Uh, pretty much ten years ago. Okay. Uh, September two thousand nine. Yeah. I, I read somewhere that you came here with practically nothing. Uh, in in what term? <laughs> like financially. <laughs> in or? in general, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean it's it's true. Like I I I mean. I decided, we, we decided kind of um, almost quite ad hoc to go to, to St. Gallen. Yeah. Like I was trying to set up a company um, with, with friends in, in Germany at that time uh, and finishing my studies and then didn't really know what to, when, when we when we kind of realized that this not, never going to end somewhere, um, all of the three of us had to look for and kind of earn some living. Mm -hmm. and I thought if I can just prolong that by like the life as a student. <laughs> and in a, uh, with, a uni uh, with a professor I, I really liked, I got to know the professor uh, Rolf Wüstenhagen where I then did my PhD. I really liked him and, and he, he just started his, his um, chair, so kind of quite ad hoc to go to St. Gallen right. and study there. It was not, I was not really thinking about going to Switzerland. Like, mm. I'd never been to Zurich, I think, up to the point where we started Impact Hub, I'd never been to Zurich actually. So you, but you were based in St. Gallen? Yeah, yeah, the first one and a half years or so when I lived in St. Gallen. Yeah. And how did the idea of, of the Impact Hub come about? Um, well, I mean, Impact Hub had been, or the hub at the time, had been around before. So the first one uh, had been uh, created in London in 2005 mm -hmm. um, by, by a group of like eight people. The later narrative was there was one founder, but it actually was a group of eight. Um, and then my co-founder later, Michel, many of you know, know Michel as well, he first wanted to do a, a, his PhD on, on the concept of Hub, mm. which he had learned through ISAC friends. 
and and then he thought, okay, I mean, he's from Zurich, so he thought there is no hub in Zurich, and he was talking around, and he met Niels, and they two kind of hooked up and said, uh, maybe we should do it, maybe not, and they were looking for more co-founders. They were looking for a finance guy, and I went to this Oikos event, and they were pitching this idea, and they were looking mm. for co-founders to do it, and said, uh, looking for a finance guy, and I said, I just tried to set up a fund for a year. Uh, it didn't work. I'm not a finance guy, but I'm interested, and kind of had a beer afterwards, and three weeks later or so, we said, let's do it. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. Um, what was what was the biggest or one of the biggest challenge that you remember from back then? Um, we there were so many. <laughs> um, I mean, first, first I think to to go in and having no idea what we are kind of signing up to. Like I thought, I thought for the first time uh, in, in the first days, I thought it's just a project. Like I thought PhD. Mm. I'm here for my PhD. I'm gonna do my PhD. And yeah, I just don't want to do research all the time, so I also do something practical. But then if you kind of sign a five-year rent agreement in Zurich West, uh, 400 square meter, which sounded massive for yeah. us at that time, and we, we, made a, we had to put a guarantee in place for the rent agreement, mm. and of course we didn't have any money, so we asked WWF to put the guarantee in, and we had a deal with WWF that we would have to work off the 300K uh, uh, it was a ridiculous high deposit, so not a deposit, but it was a guarantee. Okay. Them. Uh, and and we would have to work off that that money from WWF. So the the, the first kind of investor we sold our uh, our life to was the panda. <laughs> <laughs> and did it pay off? Uh, you mean in total today? Now yeah. fully, of course. <laughs> it has been. It has been crazy, sometimes tough. I mean, you ask for tough times, right? like uh, those first sleepless nights where you have, where you, I don't know, we had to find, um, so you have to have the money to build the space, right, initially, because, I mean, you cannot just build it all by yourself and with Brocken House only, so you have to have construction workers, and then hiring those construction workers on time, because you have to open, because the rent starts to come in, so the rent payments start to fly in, so and not, not having the money, but still hiring construction workers. And that, that moment, and I was responsible for fundraising, or like I always have been, and, uh, and that were some, some tough times. And mm. I mean, now it feels like, okay, I get, get a bit used to not having money and doing projects, <laughs> but then it didn't, and certainly not, not in excess of like 50K or 100K. So there were some tough times. Did it pay off like a thousand times? Yeah. Like, Beautiful. Coming mm -hmm. to Switzerland, like now Zurich is really home. Like it also feels like home. Mm. The people here. I mean, there's so many friends. Here. Thank you so much for coming and, <laughs> and supporting, and filling the audience as well. Really <laughs> nice. um, the stuff I learned. Uh, yeah. And the the involvement of of uh, Impact Hub um, and the the merger with uh, Colab. How did how did that come about? I don't know how many people know about the the. Uh, combining of the collab co-working space and impact hub so that's what everyone most people have have heard about that <laughs> 10 percent i mean you know the startup scene very well so you know hey can i ask another question who hasn't heard of impact hub <laughs> so it's, it's basically co-working community you can just go across the, the road here at kraftwerk have you heard kraftwerk have you seen the space I've heard it, yeah. If you I'm just walk sure. after the event, just walk in and get a drink there. That's that's one of the locations. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot of kind of entrepreneurs, freelancers, startups in, in Zurich, and, and and the basis is around sustainable development, sustainable development goals, and combined with technology. And that's when when Colab started. So Colab was a tech co-working space. It was basically between 2013 and 15 the space where techies, hackers, onlineers would go at Zentralstraße, and. Um, and when Colab start, I never, I never really go to competition. Like I see it, like in my inbox, and then I say, ah, let's do that. I, I don't, I'm not kind of so close there. Others are, so I didn't really follow what they were doing. But um, apparently, they were doing uh, a lot of things very well. Like for instance, hosting free events and mm. growing the community. And we were both getting full at Viaduct. Actually, we had Viaduct and Garage. We had two spaces already, but both were and Garage was super small, so both were kind of packed. And uh, so we, need, we wanted to extend. We couldn't extend the viaduct. And we realized we have to go into tech. Mm. Right? Every social entrepreneur needs tech. Every everybody needs tech and tech. So the first trial was me going to the first Hack Zurich 
as a HSG PhD in business, <laughs> no tech at all, trying to kind of, you know, associate with the hackers there. And like, hey, I'm also, you know, a impact hub come over. Didn't work. Like, I don't have a language. <laughs> I don't have the words. If I, speak, if I say prototyping, it's very different to what a techie thinks of or means with prototyping. So we want to go into tech. And then through Niels and Danny, Danny Frey, he was also on. He's moderating some of the Creative Wednesdays, if you're a um, good guy. And Niels and him, um, they, were, they were talking about Colab also needing a new space. Mm. And they said, why don't you build the space together? And initially, we just don't want to do that. We didn't have any ideas of merging or coming together. But then you have negotiations, you kind of fall in love with each other business-wise, and uh, both sides took quite a leap, leap of faith. Like I was going to ask about that, because uh, I, in, when I first heard about the discussions, I was a little bit concerned about the, the mixing of the two environments, because <laughs> <laughs> they're very, very, very different dynamics and very different uh, uh, personalities within each ecosystem. Um, and, you know, there's concerns that either side would lose what, you know, the, the, the valuable part that they had. Um, but at the same time, there was a need for, for that kind of collaboration. Well, it's interesting that you say that because I, th I thought that everybody from the outside just saw how beautiful it was <laughs> because, you know, it's, it's good if people join forces and something bigger uh, can grow out of it. Um, but from the inside, yeah, it was it was difficult. The different cultures. The, yeah. I mean, I think it took until um, about probably end of last year, beginning of this year, was when I would say the post merger integration was finally done. How long was that? Uh, since 2014 until yeah. the end of 2018. Like yeah. really, culture wise, governance wise, <coughs> um, setup structure, everything. It took uh, much longer than than we thought. Mm. Um, and initially, it's, I mean, there, what, what helped was that we created the space at, uh, at Limmerplatz, you know, the collab, the cafe. And so, so we had one, one big project where we had to prove that we can kind of work together on the front lines, uh, so to say. And, um, and that helped. Yeah, but it's, 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 it's funny. We, what, we, what also helped was we did a, a, a theater parody once at the new space, it was still empty, it was still kind of not even a construction site. And we said, okay, the Impact Hub side of, of co-founders will, will make a parody, a stage play of Colab, like what we perceive Colab, <laughs> and, and Colab side would do that on, on, wow. on Impact Hub. And it's, it's those things that probably we'll never forget, yeah. and they help because they give, I don't know, they, they, they I, are, I assume that's not public. <laughs> hey, I, I have to look for the video. There is a video existing of it, and I'm sure we, we find it. But it's really funny. You should see how Beat plays uh, uh, investment banker becoming a member at Impact of Zurich. It's like really funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, when you, how, how many employees does Impact Hub, Impact Hub have now? A hundred in total. No, employees. Yeah, hundred. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So, I mean, we have gastronomy now, so okay. in, so FTEs, it's much less, it's probably half of that is, is in FTEs. But still, 50 is a pretty substantial um, team to manage. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, now there are spin-offs, so kind of mm -hmm. uh, subsidiary companies. Right. They also have, like, Kickstart and, right. and okay. uh, Reverse and so. Uh, yeah, but it is, it is not the little baby where you can do what you want at all time anymore. So, so what makes, uh, so a lot of people um, are, at various stages of their of their entrepreneurship at, of their company and and um, you know there's always so much to learn about leading a company whether it's two employees or twenty or fifty or hundred. Um, what do you think makes a good CEO or you know, a leader? Oh, um, what makes a good from your experience? What? Well, as I said, I was never the CEO. So no, but you you are uh, <laughs> no, no, but one of the I, you're you are in a leadership position, yes. and a lot of people look up to you and rely on you, and you have to inspire people to uh, do their jobs. And no, no, I mean, I think um, humility, definitely, like uh, not not making yourself more important than you are because it is a. Uh, it's a group of 100 and even more people who help, so I think humility or, or staying humble is super important. Um, for me, what was always important is to have um, peers around. Um, I don't know how these uh, single entrepreneur founding 
uh, all the ventures, how we, I mean, who do they to talk to when they yeah. cannot sleep because of some uh, problem thing about in, in business all the time? I mean, partner helps, but then you also don't want to bring every problem home, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so having peers around is super important, and I would just encourage any, any founder, uh, look for co-founders. Um, it also sometimes brings, of course, um, problems. What makes a good leader? Um, well, in my case, it doesn't have to be in the whole, um, whole group of founders. What helped me was um, probably communication, communication skills, mm -hmm. um, being able to put things into words and to put vision also into words. Um, I try to be super reliant, like, uh, reliable. Like if I try to, if I say something, I actually always do it, or at least let people know I cannot do it now. Also, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, and, and also if I if I prioritize things lower, it might be the number one priority for others, for mm -hmm. team members, right? If I don't know, let's say communications, for communication person is like the number one priority. It's a kind of his own d'être in that company. Also, well, for you, you have all the other, you have financing and. Uh, Still, I think to treat it with that empathy or so, to put yourself, I think that's, that's important. Mm. Yeah, but I think co-founders, co-founding team or so was for me the most important. Also, if I think now the different stages we had of, initially, Michel was kind of the, the vision and the driver in the first couple of months or so. Um, and I was for financing, and that switched around when Michel worked on, on global stuff. So being able to take on different roles, mm -hmm. also in time or so, is, is so helpful. Yeah. yeah. And sort of continuing this, you know, what you're saying about having people to talk to as, as a founder, as a, a leader, as a CEO, but I guess mainly as a, as a founder, you, you have a lot of responsibilities, you have a lot of pressure. Um, what, do you, what tips do you have for avoiding burnout or for, um, I mean, there's, there's a topic that's coming up recently about mental health amongst founders, which is, hasn't been discussed enough, but I think it's an, an important topic because it's, it's very relevant and something that, you know, should be more openly discussed and so that you can uh, get help and support when, when needed. But sometimes also there's, there's simple things that can be done to, to avoid that. How have you um, been able to, ha, have you experienced any burnout or have you been able to, to manage your... So I've experienced not with myself, but in my surrounding several burnouts yeah. now already, probably a handful at least, and it's, it's really not good. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it leaves a scar for, for long on the people affected, I think. Um, and I agree, it's, it's still not talked about enough in entrepreneurship, like you always see the, the cool side of entrepreneurship also that in the media and on Facebook and, and so, and you can safely say that 50% uh, or, or, or more of founders are constantly close to that, to that near burnout. Mm -hmm. I mean, with all the, you are, I mean, almost every day you feel like you, you've not been um, educated, skilled, experienced for what you do, like almost every day, like there's n almost no day where you kind of do just entirely what you've been trained to do. And, and that over, over multiple years or so is, is hard. What helped, so I've, I've uh, fortunately never been very close, I think. I mean, there have been a uh, few nights where I couldn't sleep, and so that's an indicator for me. If I, if I wake up two or three nights in a row at like three, four o'clock, I know I have to drop things immediately and like really take care of myself. And that has happened maybe twice in 10 years or so, maybe mm -hmm. three times, I have to look over. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, people, people are sometimes, um, uh, they, they seem, um, it seems to be uh, sort of uh, special or extraordinary in a way that I have multiple projects, so people come to me regularly to say, hey, be careful, don't burn out, and it, it seems to be a topic, but um, I don't know, for me it was being able to drop the ball if, if I feel health, I mean health is first, right, health, family first, is like, and, mm -hmm. and to be, um, to be able to do that and put boundaries that always help me and that's a bit of my personality also. I can set those boundaries and just say I don't, I don't care yeah. basically. 
uh, sports always helped. Uh, whatever it is for you, right? Meditation, sports, um, having having a partner who challenges you if if, if you are going obviously too far. Um, but it's heartbreaking to see some of the um, yeah, some of the close friends of mine who have been in there. I mean, mm. Roman, urban farmer's father, yeah. he, he just uh, was, was sharing his story at the fuck up night, and he had some heavy, heavy times for two, three years. I mean, we had a burnout for uh, burnout amongst founder events when mm. he was on stage, and I think he was fully in it, and he said like, oh, I'm not really. Um, it's it's really tough. It's really tough. Yeah. Um, if if during the course of the conversation, anyone has any question, just raise your hand and we'll take a question from you as well. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the different initiatives that, that you're involved in. You know, so we've been talking about Impact Hub, um, but that's not the only thing you do. What else do you do? <laughs> um, so I guess you ask professionally in a way. Uh, yeah. So, so Im Impact Hub. Zurich, um, the organization I co-founded in, uh, t uh, 10 years ago, that's there I do mostly, I would say, business development, mm -hmm. long-term, long larger project um, and, and governance board and setting up governance as we grow. Um, then Kickstart is a, um, it's a subsidiary, a spin-off of, of Impact Up, Kickstart Accelerator. I think most of you have probably also heard. Sometimes it's even more out there than, than Impact Up because mm -hmm. of all the corporates and the Switzerland uh, behind. Uh, so it was founded by Digital Switzerland, but we took it over as a mandate. Right. And then two years later, we took over the whole program in a way and, okay. and built a company around it. Uh, there, I also would say I do business development and sales in particular. I mean, Kickstart lives uh, or, or, or the Kickstart revenue comes from uh, large organizations as partners who, who pay to be part of, in the program. Um, so that's my role. Then uh, Yoga. Uh, company I co-founded um, with a very close friend of mine. Um, so it, uh, we have four co-founders. I was the last one to join there. It's a sustainable fintech company. Uh, now doing also gender equality investment with Meta and Think Yellow. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier that I tried to set up a company before coming right. to Switzerland. And that was an impact investing fund. Okay. We didn't call it that. We called it social venture capital in Germany. Um, but since 2007 or 8, I'm, I'm thinking about this kind of capital, social, environmental, where is money allocated to? And, and we tried long with Viaduct Ventures, an initiative, mm -hmm. in Impact Up. Um, and then when, when Tillman came along with the idea of Yova, of bringing retail investors, so everyone into impact investing or enabling everyone to become an impact investor, I, I, I joined that. And there I help on the funding rounds mostly, and maybe strategy or... And sometimes also keeping the founders sane, so the co-founders sane. If I have to. So, t t what is in, in a nutshell, or what's what's the the elevator pitch for for Yova investing? Um, oh, elevator pitch. You're a co-founder <laughs> after all, right? <laughs> hey, I was, last week I was the first time on stage actually presenting Yova in Liechtenstein. It was really mm. fun. I, I actually enjoyed it because normally Eric and Tillman they are the 100% uh, co-founders in there uh, do this. So, so Yova enables everyone who can invest 2,000 Swiss francs, which is probably all of you. Um, everyone, uh, a lot of people in Switzerland, of course. So everyone from 2,000 Swiss francs investing their money in companies that they like, that, that, that fits to your values or, or interests say you care for CO2 emission or gender equality or, um, I don't know, uh, human rights or so, the Yoga engine builds a portfolio of, um, of stocks. So mm. you become an owner, not, not a fund, you become an owner of these companies. Um, and, and, and with that, basically, can participate on the stock market. So if things go well, you should have 5 6% annual return of it, a long-term investment, nothing for like day trading. And you invest in companies that fit to your interests. That's, and there's so far no one in Europe that's doing or can do something like that in okay. this class of retail investment. How do you define, because so from what I understand, or for one of the, the, the aspects is that it's impact investing. How do you define impact? Well, it's a positive social or environmental uh, impact. Um, so essentially, um, I mean that that's ex it basically yeah. <laughs> that's the definition. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, do you um, do you have a, a 
strict criteria selection process for that, or how do you go about? Now in, in Yoba, in particular, yes, yeah, for, so for providing portfolio companies. Yeah, so in, in Yoba, since it's an investment for everyone, like for retail investors, not like professional or, or like angel investors or yeah. so. Uh, we only invest in, in large companies, so large stock listed companies, mm -hmm. um, and and there you basically look for comp. So we have a we both buy data like how much CO two emission has a has a company or how many um, what's the share of the employees that have access to childcare facilities or family friendly policies or so okay. that, that kind of data we can buy and then we also source our own data online mm -hmm. basically from public available data. And, and through that you build a big database and then you come you come to some cases that are um, that are amazing like uh, I don't know um, Vestas or so like uh, renewable energies right the wind turbines or so you can you know, share out our Vestas or Tesla now all the Tesla shares did really well uh, most recently um, but also some surprising cases uh, in, in, in my first portfolio I had Lufthansa in there and I said I don't want to own a I don't want to have a share of a, of a uh, airline uh, airline because I, I care for CO2 but then the, the engine and that was two and a half years ago but even then the engine company so the outcome was it explained me why they picked uh, Lufthansa hmm. and it was because of gender equality is also important for me and and they had some policies or so so explaining also and showing a bit of the trade-offs right in is is also a way of uh, of the theory of change of your right which is very different to what we tried 10 years ago right that was hardcore Kenya off-grid solar mm -hmm. high-risk investment but you cannot go to the mainstream retail investor out there and say you should invest in uh, in off-grid solar right in, in, in Eastern Africa it's interesting yes uh, I have a question. Uh, how would you Um, so my question is actually, uh, how would you assess ESG, kind of the environmental social governance standards uh, across, let's say, uh, you know, what is known as, yeah, you know, it's a good impact, there's good impact companies uh, where Facebook is super high and yeah. Microsoft is super high and then uh, how would you assess that in part of the impact investment? Do you think it's a good standard or is it a... Well, I think it's far not enough. It's by far not enough. Yes. Okay. Actually, there was a big article in Tagesan Saiga, I think this week, from uh, around Yoba, also in Tillman, and I think the headline was ESG is not enough, basically. So <laughs> I invite you to, to look into that. I mean, there's, there's even more surprising things. It's if you if you want to invest, and like assuming you, you don't go to a private bank with your five million or so and, and upwards, and they can give you custom things, at a retail bank, you get like the normal off-the-shelf things, or right now more and more robo advisors, right? Like scalable capital and others. And now they also have sustainable funds, and they use the iShare category from BlackRock. And if you go into the iShare MSCI sustainability something, and you only see the first, the biggest position, you see Total in there, you see McDonald's in there, and that's the sustainability thing that you buy. So I think there is, um, they will be called out for that, I assume, in future. I, I can add something. Please. I, don't know if I, need to find I mean, you're the moderator. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sometimes sitting on the other side. <laughs> the, the, the question is also because I, there's a new vegan ETF. I don't know if you've seen it. No, it's, it's awful. Yeah. It's really, it's, it's, it's awful. I mean, I, I think one of the biggest shares they hold are uh, Royal Caribbean, Norwegian, which are both cruise ships. Providers, it's it's really on the on the edge, and it's called vegan ETF. Yeah, but now now yeah. I think uh, Nestle brings the vegan burger, so Nestle will make it to these. That's a good point. So, yeah, they're always at the top. Yeah. No, it's 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 really. I mean, I like with with any any internet offering, any any now user centric design, people people are asking for transparency, right? And and I think what we see now is with Evolut, with N twenty six, and so it seems to be that this online only. Banking is, is finally arriving. I mean, I think what fintech had said like seven years ago, like mm. we're going to disrupt banking, and then three years later we're going to partner with banks. That's what happened in fintech. Maybe it's now, uh, maybe we are lucky with just the right timing of Evolutes and 26 and the others that normal people are getting used to trying on online finance solutions. Right. But still, I guess the main, the main question is, and, and I've heard this from other people as well, um, also about, about Yoba, is how, like, like, like he was asking, how do you um, vet a, a 
yeah, a, a, an investment portfolio, a, a company that, and, and it is interesting what you said, how, for example, Lufthansa, if they have made significant efforts and they do have a high standard when it comes to, to equality or diversity, then that brings out something, something different. But does that mean, does that still qualify as impact? Well, for, for me, I kick them out. So <laughs> no, that, that's the point. I mean, we, um, we don't try to um, give, give customers like this is sustainable and you right. have to do that. We try to create transparency. Like your money is exactly in that stock. There's no middleman. These are the stocks that, that we suggest to you. But if you don't like that, or if you, you can just put it out and then calculate new, get a new one in. Mm -hmm. There might be very personal reasons. I don't know. Your uncle was fired from Gebelit and now I don't want to invest in Gebelit. So I kick it out. I get in. So the, the idea of creating transparency and, and, and not ripping off retail customers and giving some intelligence on on the sustainability aspects but also on other aspects of it. I think that is that's a true idea. And again that is very different to the impact first professional investor league of like I did my PhD on impact investing and, and that was all we looked for. Right? right when you looked at an impact investing report that was So it's it's a very broad term now then. Well I mean I, it's funny, last week on this pitch, uh, I had the, the GIN, right, Global Impact Investor Network definition, and it, it purely fits still this super broad, which, which is basically saying investment with the intentionality of positive social or environmental impact, which is every investment has an impact, we know it, even your cash. Or, or has an intention. No, not everyone has an intention. You might have very awesome impact, but without any intention. Hmm. Uh, that actually happen, happens quite a lot also, where, where it's, I mean, I think the entire job creation in, in, in low economic uh, environments is companies go in, they want to make money, right. and it has a very good social impact of creating jobs and, and livelihoods and so, but it wasn't, there was not the intentionality of that. And, and that's basically what we think customers have. They have certain intentionality of where my money is. I mean, they okay. go out of street on March for uh, Fridays for the Future. They think about, do I buy vegan or vegetarian food for my kids or so? And they will put their money into something where, where, where that they, they resonate with. Yeah. yeah. Um, so talking about these these different topics that people march for, <laughs> um, I think I, th I recall seeing something about uh, um, the um, basic income for everyone that you were involved in a while back. I mean, that was a big topic, I think, last year or the year before. Well, I think it is, still is. Uh, the idea is still around. I, I wasn't really, really involved in. I mean, I think I, uh, I think. Maybe uh, liked a few those, Facebook those, posts those, or something. <laughs> those who were asked for kind of people or quotes or so. And hmm. I certainly, I, I like the idea of it. I like the idea of, of um, universal or in German like un unconditional, right? That, mm. that it's not bound, that, that everybody has a basis kind of economically and then you, you get the best out of people and I, th I think it's also a very positive view on, on human beings. Um, I, I haven't studied it enough to understand the, the whole economics. I mean, I think that the, um, the promoters of it say since you can <coughs> decrease a lot of other social welfare and others, it actually pays off very well. There mm. are, there are experiments being done. I think in Finland there there, there was an experiment around it, which I, I haven't heard the results from. Yeah. So, like, philosophically and, and intuitively, I, I really like the idea. I really want to have it, or I would like to explore it or so. Um, but I don't know if I if uh, if I were a politician, if I could kind of vote for it now or uh, kind of push for back it in. Uh, yeah. back for it yeah. mm. because I haven't studied it enough. To yeah. Study. Yeah, for sure. There's, I mean, there's a lot more complexity than what you read in the media. Yeah. Can I, can I check? I'm just really curious. Like, I'm going to ask who's in favor, who's not in favor of UBI, universal basic income. Who's in favor of UBI? Let's see. And who's against UBI? No, <laughs> uh, you are talk. <laughs> and the rest, I don't know. I don't give a shit. It's okay. <laughs> Yeah, interesting. No, I'm 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 in favor. <laughs> and back a little bit to to your 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 personal your day to day. How do you how do you balance um, Impact Hub, Yova Invest, uh, Kickstart, um, a wife, and whatever uh, sports and whatever else that uh, keeps you busy? 
Um, how do I balance it? So I, I think I'm fairly focused. So when I do something, I, I do this and, and, uh, and only this, yeah. even if it's five minutes or two hours or so. Uh, and um, how do I split up my time? I would say it's, it's roughly uh, of my entire time, 45% Impact Hub Zurich, 45% Kickstart, and then 10% Yoga, mm -hmm. roughly. And, of course, that's not 42 hours, but it's also not like 80 hours anymore or so. So I think that it wouldn't be unsustainable over long. It has been sometimes, but maybe it's 50 to 60 hours per week, roughly, I would say. Um, and I mean, we, we don't have children yet, so the rest is either sports or time together, hiking mm -hmm. or not. Um, all the vacations, surfing, and when I'm on vacation, I'm pretty much on vacation. I mean, I, I sometimes do have work, but yeah, I, I, I'm not someone who's kind of constantly on the phone right. on the beach or so. Um, <laughs> definitely not. Okay. We go four, four, four to five weeks over Christmas and New Year's. Mm -hmm. That's really like off, off, and that's nice. Uh, that gives energy. For sure. Yeah. It's yeah. also nice to have something like for every every founder. If you're so committed to your company or companies, and um, and over time, founders get really like super linked to it, right? And and, and then we, when they have to step out or for whatever reason, or, like others taking over, so it's good to have some other identities. And I know I always have the surfing identity. Do you surf here in Zurich as well? Uh, well, we did it once on the on the surf up there. Actually, yeah. in Stop, now a, a wave park coming, okay. so fully kind of running wave, and I'm nice. quite excited to see. I know it's not yet fully decided, but it looks. I, I think they just have one more political step <laughs> to go over. And, cool. It's, it's not, not a sustainable hobby if you live in, in Switzerland. <laughs> we did uh, a trip by train and then to San Sebastian and then and with surfboards, it's really not easy. Yeah. That, that one we haven't figured out fully. <laughs> so after the last 10 years involved in the Swiss startup scene, you've seen a lot of the different ecosystems. And what's, what's something that you really love about the startup scene here in, in Switzerland or in, in Zurich? And what's something that you don't like very much? Um, so proximity, I think I like it very much. The proximity or closeness of people. You you quite fast get to know almost everyone or so, or it, or it feels like. I mean, particularly the Swiss, right? I mean, they everybody has gone to school together or so, and knows someone who has been with Kanti with someone or so, <laughs> and and that that gives a, a a kind of a social fabric, a social network you can build on because it has some some trust in there. And I actually like it. Of course, there's a, also a, a flip side of that, which is kind of uh, people are not necessarily only um, are not only benefiting based on on, on uh, merit or based on ability or so, just because of noise. So it's hard also for a new entrant. So when when we started, it was super hard. Like really, like mm. I think even the city looked at us as a <laughs> weird competitor. Like we were the social tree huggers, and then from St. Gallen, which didn't make sense for people. So. <laughs> so um, so it's hard to enter that. No, but, but I think that's, that's a, the smaller flip side of, of the bigger advantage of this, this proximity. Um, what I dislike, I mean, definitely the, the still disconnectedness between Romandie and, and, and um, Zurich area, Zurich, Basel, and Romandie, and so. Röstigrabe, I mean, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous that there's a competition within a country that's so small. I think it's even, and I'm, I'm promoting a lot of Swiss ecosystem, so you will see quotes from me like, we want to put Swiss startup ecosystem top and la. Actually, I would like to put European startup ecosystem mm. on top because it's so short-sighted. I mean, we are nowhere with Switzerland compared to, to China, compared to US market or so. As Europe, 500 million inhabitants, if we were work together more, so it's not us against Berlin or London, it's like, how can we build those ecosystems together? Yeah. So. We have the, uh, I, I recently heard, last week I heard that the Cantonli, Cantonli Geist, you know this Cantonli Geist? Cantonli Geist is basically a competition between the cantons, in a, in a way. That even exists in the city, there is a Gemeinde Geist or so, so there's, <laughs> or Kreisli, there's one Kreis against the others, and if they get a, get a new uh, swimming pool, the other Kreis also wants a swimming pool, although one swimming pool makes sense for the city, and, and you have it on Canton. And, and we, we must not fall into that trap. I that's mean, you, true. You have to be able to hold multiple identities. I think that's who was that the um, ah, the author who wrote uh, Harari. Uh, who, uh, he, he wrote about this or he speaks about this multiple identity. You have to be able to be super local, like for Zurich against and and global, like with Europe and even local citizens, right? I think 
to be able to hold those things, I would like to see that more in the Swiss startup ecosystem. For sure. I mean, the whole global perspective is something that I bring up quite often. You know, and I compare Switzerland with, with Israel often because yeah. both countries are very small, extremely innovative. But the big difference, or one of the big differences, is that I mean, is Israeli startups, they think global from day one. Swiss startups, they think local from day one. And if they think global, they think Dach. Mm. And that's as far as the world goes. <laughs> well, I, 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 I think it's changing now. I it think is. There's, uh, like, it's improving, it, yeah. so but there's the still... last three years, you have, you have now growth capital coming, more, right. more and more growth capital. You have you know, a few role models who have thought global or have then went global. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, if, if I look around kind of my group, I mean, like I mentioned Tillman and Erik, we had this conversation six months after founding. Mm -hmm. Like I said, can we imagine building a global company like actually Having, having to manage people in Singapore and New York. Can you imagine that lifestyle? Right. Um, and I, th I, I see that more now. There's no trains to Singapore. Sorry, there's no trains. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> and it's important, right? Everything is a balance. Like, there's no one, there's no black or white. <laughs> For sure. Taking all in sustainability. Like, I know. Uh, um, speaking of, of community, um, what is, what is community, what do you define as community? What does community mean to you and how do you see that uh, being applied in other, in other business ecosystems? Um, how do I define it? So, I mean, first of all, community for me is super important. I think one of the reasons I got attracted initially of the hub idea was community and the physical element of it. Right. Like community, uh, mean, for me, it's about personal relationships, uh, relationships to people. Um, authentic relationships, not just transactional. I mean, you, you hear of communities in co-working spaces also, which are, in my view, purely transactional business relationships. Mm -hmm. and, and I think a business relationship is, is good and it also helps to strengthen ties, right? Whoever trades doesn't go to war. It's also true in small, if you kind of are in business, you have contacts. But, um, but certainly community is, is the, the, the majority of that is for me, personal relationship, authenticity, that, that kind of element. Um, and then how do I see that applied in other, I mean, maybe, maybe even social networks or so, it's, it's also like sometimes thrown in that for me, like all the platform, they're not really communities in a way. Like mm. it's, it's basically, you are a feature of a product if you are on a, on a social media, uh, uh, social media site, um, very different to what we do and live and, and it's hard work. Community work is super hard work. I think you can, you can safely judge if you do, in, in my definition of community work, it's if you work a lot for it, there is not much efficiency, you cannot scale it, you cannot scale human relationship with venture capital, like right. just throwing millions on something and then popping up new hubs or whatever, there is no, it, it takes time. I mean, the approach that our friends from WeWork did to the approach what Impact Up did, I mean, 10 years and 15 years in the game, I think very different outcomes. Similar language sometimes if you go on the website, but very different experience yeah. if you walk into the space. Yeah. And I think we, we always approached Impact Hub as community and only secondary as real estate or as, I still don't know the, square meter, uh, the revenue per square meter after 10 years, mm -hmm. but I know how many meaningful relationships we've done in the community last year yeah. because that's what we measure. So it's, yeah, it's really at the core of what Impact Hub is. Right. So just following up to that question, so in the beginning when you were pitching in fact up to anyone, what so in the uh, beginning when you were pitching in fact up to someone, of course you would get this question, how would you make money? And what was your answer at that moment? I had to look up in the business plan from back then. No, but I mean the physical element helped, like to say that we, we actually have co I mean, co work. There was only citizen space, so there wasn't, it wasn't like today. Um, yeah. So the, the concept co working wasn't known, but the idea of somebody renting an, a place in an office and paying for that, that made sense to people. It helped that we, there were 12, 13, 14 other hubs around the world, so we could always say, yeah, it's already re working so well in London and, and Milano and Vienna. It, it wasn't. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> first generation of hub, we all struggled heavily, and then uh, several didn't make it, um, but it, it helped to pitch it, um, to build on, on, on kind of similar examples. I, I, I mean, before opening, we thought the business model is never going to work in Zurich. I mean, you. 
you pay rent, and you take something like rent, membership fee, which is associated to the workspace. And in between, you have a lot of HR because you do all these community stuff. That cannot work in, in high HR, high rent environments. Um, so we thought we have to add in a lot of programs and, and, and services or so to make the model work. And the first one was Impact Hub Fellowship, or Hub Fellowship at that time, was WWF. So WWF would pay us to find entrepreneurs who wanted to build an environmental venture, which fit to the mission of WWF. It was really Thomas Velakot and I, he wasn't a CEO back then, and uh, we were sitting together, what can we do? And he said, do this program, you do, you do this program, and we're going to kind of fund the first one. And that was Roman Gauss, urban farmers, uh, up and down and up again. So yeah, so, yeah sorry for a bit longer answer. No, 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 no that, that's good, because so, uh, just to conclude, so in the beginning you had this rent was the main channel and plus a sponsorship, right? And yeah, I mean, so first of all, the investment, to build up, like we had to do the refurbishment and so, half we, um, we, we took in loans and half we got from foundations. So we pitched the same, Avina was one of the first one, Avina Foundation, who supported them, it was a grant, it was amazing, you didn't have to pay it back. And the grants, we did kind of crowd, no, community funding ourselves, not with a platform, we asked everyone in the community, could you uh, uh, give us a, a loan for um, between 1,000 and 5,000 Swiss francs? We will pay it back in two years, no interest rate and no guarantees. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we collected, I think, 87K or so. Um, and we did pay back for those who wanted, not everybody wanted. Um, and we got a loan from Alternative Bank and, uh, and Freie Gemeinschaftsbank. So that was the initial investment. And then the, the, the operational income was co-working memberships. Uh, also, we have Impact Hub has these, these memberships that are not related to co-working. Like every, every member is, first of all, a member, with, regardless if he uses the space or not. And, and that is not l limited to the space. Like that's actually scalable, mm -hmm. um, if you can scale the relationships or the <laughs> interactions, let's say. Um, so that was main revenue, and then renting out the, the, events, uh, the event space and the meeting rooms. So initially, the hub model was, I think, 60% on average coming from memberships and 40% coming from um, uh, room rentals. Uh, that was the average when we started in the network. And, and sponsorship wasn't even in there in the beginning. And then we got more and more in contact with corporates. And first, we just, we are, actually, we, we even didn't even ask for money. We asked for internet and insurance. And these were all first sponsors, Swisscom and, and AXA. And then working with them, they wanted to use our space, and then they were interested in the entrepreneurs and the members, so we started kind of a, uh, like an executive education program. So we, we sort of moved from asking for in-kind sponsorship to, um, uh, to, to building services and new programs. Just one thing on the top of that. So did you hear this, that this is not a VC case? Uh, when you're pitching this, like, it's not a VC case because you cannot escape because the whole thing. So did you hear that from someone, and did you? How you well, one, one of the still around VCs was fun. We we uh, we met him and he said, "I like the model, but please leave out the social." <laughs> <laughs> we obviously didn't find each other. Um, I mean, as as ridiculous the case study uh, as it is, but we were proved it is a VC case. Don't know if that's something good or bad. I mean, I think right now we see that it has been a bit over the edge uh, of what you can do as a VC case. Um, I think our model was never a VC case. I mean, first of all, we don't own the brand locally. The brand is owned by an association where every hub member has one vote, basically like a cooperative. So the whole idea is, in, is and, and so the headquarters are all of us, are all the impactors. So if you wanted to sell it, with, as you take on VC, at that moment you have to have a liquidity event at some point, right? So if we wanted to sell Impact Up, we first have to do a rebranding, which colleagues have done, which is not very cool because you have to explain why. And, and you know, there comes what was your initial idea. I joined as a member, I create a lot of value. Like every member creates value in a community. But these members are not asked if you do a capital raise or if you do an exit. They are just, you know, fooled also. So I think in our approach that was never a VC case, we also didn't, uh, apart from this one, we never asked one. And I don't even know why we were there. 
uh, this one. Certainly not because we didn't have a, an equity pitch deck. Mm -hmm. We also didn't know what it is. But <laughs> <laughs> so, what what advice would you give to a younger you? Um, don't do a PhD and the founding at the same time. Don't just either like put the founding on ice for two years and try to push through the PhD or. Uh, probably clearer, just drop the PhD and do the, the, the startup. That's definitely one. I mean, looking back, it feels like, okay, go more all in or be even more audacious or so. But then I know how it felt back then. It, it felt very audacious. I mean, 400. Or it already felt 100%. Yeah, it, it, felt, it felt like uh, all this. Um, imagine that it's, it's possible. Like, if you look at our 2010 business plan, where we had five-year projection in, we were betting much lower than it comes. And I think that seems counterintuitive. Maybe it's, it's like for normal startup standards, right? All these grandesque projections of hockey stick and everything. But that's the portrait startup world out there on TechCrunch and everything. For all the others of us who are also building kind of SMEs or organically growing companies or so, it's, we don't probably tell those stories mm -hmm. so much. And um, at least for myself, I also didn't believe it. Like if you would have asked me yeah, 10 years from now, 100 employees and, and multiple thousands of square meters of space and multiple business, I would, no way, never. I thought it's a project. We do it with four or five friends. Yeah. And then it runs in, in the viaduct and it's, it's cool. Mm -hmm. So I think telling my younger self, hey, dare that it's possible. So I might have made a few other different decisions, or decisions a little bit differently if I dared that all this can, can happen. I, we had a retreat with kind of my collab co-founders Friday, Saturday, and, and I, I told them, even when we were on these negotiations about the merger, I, I, I didn't believe that it could possibly happen. <laughs> Like two organizations coming together, throwing all their ego behind and doing half-half, and, and it worked. So now I'm a bit more, like we look at a few big, bigger spaces here, and I'm 99% sure something will work out. Hmm. <laughs> so you're more, more courageous. Yeah. Uh, if you've seen what, what can happen without knowing, you can safely say, of course we don't know how, but yeah. it will somehow happen. Hmm. And then what advice would you give to uh, entrepreneurs wanting to start their business today? Yeah, look for co-founders, right? I, I, I think I shared, shared that. Yeah. Um, I think co-founder is super important. Do the, um, do the extra mile, take a bit more time. Um, put a SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, have I heard? 17 goals, global goals that we as humanity have decided we have to work on. Like, put SDGs at the core of your work. You don't have to build a social venture or you also don't have to kind of do an NGO, like you can build a hockey stick, VC case, whatever, a big business, but kind of at the core, I think build something that's really kind of um, yeah, helping, like building the world you really want to live in and not something on the side, which is just, I mean, I don't know. I think that's important. Like, in the end, all of us will have some kind of success. I assume here living in Zurich, we are already super fortunate. So why leaving a legacy, anything else, than making a positive contribution? Um, I think that's that's all. Give advice as well. Um, you mentioned that you are now involved in like three business ideas. Let's say my my question is around. Because ideas are easy, implementation is the key. And are there any any examples from from your business cases where you had like an issue or some bottleneck in terms of implementation of that idea and how you how you came across and how how was the sec what, what was the succeed factor how you succeeded actually? So to your question, uh, yes, uh, every day <laughs> <laughs> I feel it, and there are some colleagues also around. Um, there is so many ideas, in particular in the company companies I'm in, or not not all. Like um, Yoba, compared to Impact Hub, for instance, is quite focused, right? There is, uh, if you would ask Yoba, they would say we are all over the place. Also, like we have multiple ideas, B two B, B two C, or not. But Impact Hub is 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 that on steroids because we have a thousand members and almost equally as many partners who constantly come also with ideas to us, 
and we have ideas. So there's always too many ideas, there's always too little execution and implementation. For me, it's, it's so for my personal role, is um, first of all, leaving space. So trusting others will take your idea, your company, or yours um, equally or better than you do. Um, I think that's, that's something you have to do as you grow up as an organization, if you want to grow as an organization, not everybody wants it. Um, oh, what else? Yeah, I think being in particular conscious of, of uh, which contribution you as an individual can, can do. Like, I think in, in Impact Up this year is the first year in my, in my life, you know, in a way, that I've, not, um, that I've moved out of management, out of operational management, which could go anywhere. And I'm sitting, not, I don't sit in the meetings anymore, but uh, I think it's going beautifully. It's going better than ever. I mean, I think we are in a better situation than many, many years with Impact Up. And I don't know what the, which part has my leaving to do with that. There might be something. Uh, and, yeah, I mean, you, you, you're laughing, of, of, of course. I, I know also have a positive contribution to, to the organization, but I also take a lot of space. As a founder, you always take a lot of space without knowing that. And, and taking a step back makes space for others to take a step forward. Yeah. But still, I mean, I, I'd love to have more and more such amazing people like we have around so that we can implement even more ideas that we have. Uh, well <laughs> we had a bit of bet going on. Yes. It was good to hear your advice. I'm currently doing a PhD and I started a company at the same time, so uh, that sounds amazing. Um, yeah. Um, so, and we've been facing the choice um, of where to base the company, um, so we have an environmental impact and um, we've seen several advantages of doing it in Zurich. We're talking to WWF, um, um, but still went for uh, starting the company in, in Germany so that we have the liberty and access to European funding and really bootstrap it. Um, so I wanted to hear how you perceive the development in Zurich in terms of funding, specifically with an environmental impact. How do you see that uh, ecosystem developing in Zurich? Just to know whether we could shift it back to you. Yeah, I mean, also related to what I said earlier, I think um, Zurich and, and Switzerland is really cha changing quite, so the rate of change is quite high. We might not be Silicon Valley or Israel or London yet, but the rate of change from three years ago or seven years ago, it's, it's quite big. Yes, that's and, true. And so there is there's seed money all around. I mean, there's so many angels around and like everybody wants to be an entrepreneur, everybody with money wants to be an angel investor or so. And but this money is, is tied locally, right? If uh, we're working on a problem that does not exist in Switzerland, so... No, no, particularly in, in environmental and social ventures, there's sometimes even the problem that people think, okay, this is cases for Sub-Saharan Africa or so, and they do put their money there. So you have Quadia, um, which are based in Geneva, or LGT Venture Philanthropy or so, you have with multiple funds that do even seed investments, I mean, LGT not anymore so much, but um, in, in, in places that are further away, um, and being located in Germany is not a problem at all, tapping into financing in Switzerland also, um, and with regards to environmental uh, stuff, so there's um, yes, WWF is, they are doing also venture funding now and they, WWF Switzerland has always been the strongest branch or one of the stronger branches of WWF who has the ability to do things like that and headed now by a very, very visionary uh, CEO. Um, and I mean, Übermorgen Fund is now coming, so uh, Adi Bura and Mike Neve, Dubel founder, they, they're uh, raising a, a venture capital fund for CO2 reduction now. Um, you saw, I think the uh, what is it called, blue ocean, not blue ocean, um, blue ocean, blue something. The, the group investing in, in vegan food only, also based here. Sorry for not mixing that up, but it's uh, uh, it's also a venture fund that they're not investing. So I think with the growth of um, VC or, or funding, plus plus a strong foundation ecosystem, right, and foundations also willing to give money to for profits, so impossible. And you have all the climate thing, you have the climate elections, you have the climate marches, so this, this will even grow much stronger in the next one or two years. So come back and... <laughs> no, it's fine, it's Europe, right? Uh, 
Speaking of funding, would you advise people to take um, funding early on or try to bootstrap as long as they can? That depends so much on the, the route you're choosing. I mean, um, I, I like the idea of promoting organic growth and SME growth and, and kind of family business type of growth, also the startup ecosystem, that if we talk about startups, that we don't only talk about financing rounds, mm -hmm. exits, but also of revenue and, and other figures that are actually also very kind of showing the health of an organization. So I, I like that part. But then you have business money. Yoga is a kind of asset management online business case that is yeah. uh, all or nothing in a way. What about exit strategies? Is that something I'm, to consider early I'm, on? I mean, I'm not really familiar with it. I've never done an exit, yeah. or at least not, not the one that you would call uh, uh, exit. Um, and I mean, funny, we, I was talking to a family office from a potential Series A investor last week uh, for Yoga, and he was asking me about our exit strategies. And I was a bit like, okay, maybe he was just wanted to know if we can even imagine doing an exit, which mm -hmm. I think it's clear. I mean, the point, as I said, the moment you take on VC, yeah. you have to have a liquidity event, which is not dividend payments. Like the VC has to end, that's all, all just pure economics. So if you take VC, you will have an exit in one way or the other, or you get the VC out in, in very rare cases. Mm -hmm. So yes, for us, that's that. Uh, so I, had, I could say yes, <laughs> we thought about it. And yes, we could think of everything from a trade sale to an IPO. I think IPOs is, is, is um, from the economics of the case is possible, although the likelihood for IPO is still very low. Trade sale is rather high likelihood in fintech because all these banks and stuff, they have a problem soon and they cannot build what we build in, in meaningful time. So they will start shopping, basically. Yeah. Um, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Is, is there any more questions from the audience? Does Impact Hub have uh, interest to develop other social startups? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> As the question was with ideas, we constantly have ideas. Um, so, so within the Impact Hub community, there are, of course, there are many social ventures or so that we support, um, be it as a kind of normal member in a way, you, you get connections and, and the workspace in the community. Um, then there's participants and programs like take Kickstart for instance, it's a bit more later stage. So there's companies with five to 50, 100 employees or so in it. And next year, when is this gonna be screened? Uh, in a week is, or two. Uh, is, it, is it live? Okay. Um, <laughs> That's true, it's also live. Uh, so, so we're gonna do something in circular economy um, in Kickstart next year. So there we expect many circular, so more environmental than social cases in there. Um, and we are approached a lot by people who want to start a social venture and, and ask for help, connection, becoming a member or whatnot. So, yes. That's, that's great to hear. And um, yes, just like you said, it's quite interesting to hear what you said um, before. Um, when you get told the, the business plan is awesome, can you leave the social part? <laughs> because I also hear heard the same thing. Um, me and uh, the other two friends, we've been not with business plan, but have been um, trying to build a social community to help people to make friends and settle down. And amongst us, we've had definitely followers, over 15,000 um, followers, but no business, you know, plan on it because one of the reasons is, you know, when you are driven by the social purpose, the impact, and not necessarily it makes a good business plan. Yeah. No, I think it's, um, so I was just, so that was recently that you get that fee feedback, like no social or so? Uh, or? All the time, actually. The time. So <laughs> I, I'm hoping that it's, it's changing now also, that as you s uh, see some examples now of kind of um, successful tech entrepreneurs putting their money and efforts into social environmental causes. So I think there's a whole mindset shift uh, going on, I, I hope, and I hope it's not just the very small impact on bubble, but a bigger also startup ecosystem that's waking up. Um, we heard it 10 years ago, this, this quote I, I mentioned, and we were, we were really a bit ridiculed in the beginning, as like I mentioned Treehugger early, I, I heard that right in the beginning, and now 
I don't think anyone would come to Impact Up and say it's this is just the social non-business. There is nothing. I mean, there's still maybe people who don't like it, but at least this criticism has has changed. Both I think the zeitgeist has changed as well as the development of of the hub. I would just I mean on 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 these ideas, just be super clear on, and and that can change. But as it changes, also changes like um, if you evolve over time to reflect on it and be clear on what kind of organizations are, uh, organization are you creating, right? Do you have revenue? Do you have actual clients and revenue? If yes, well then debt or equity funding is possible. If, if not, it's grants. And, and, and being very clear in the language and stuff and not mix, mixing that in the team and say, yeah, and then we're gonna leverage impact finance and la la la. It's a, do you have revenue or not? Who's paying? Who's the customer? So all this lean startup stuff, you, you do it regardless if it's kind of social ventures or not. I have really clarity on, 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 on revenues, paying customers or not, benefit, beneficiaries. Um, and then you can think, is it, is it any recurring revenue? Is it revenue that comes in automatically almost with a bit of churn? Or is it like Kickstart where you have to run every year and then ask for partners to join, which is a very different business model than, than yoga fits. So, I think that's another learning I, I had over the way. This is knowing in what business are you in and this clarity. Like Impact Up, we are this fancy social innovation thing. But we are also just a, a, a restaurant. We are also something like a hotel or an office rental or a fitness studio. You have a membership. Instead of training your body, you train yourself, connections, and company. So knowing in what business you are in helps a lot to put away the the outside communication and, and amongst your team to be clear on this. Yeah, and uh, I think you could probably go on for another hour or two. <laughs> it's already been an hour. Okay. So, um, Thank you for staying. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's super interesting. There's so many topics to cover and, and you know, especially I think you, know, you being involved in from, from the community side, from the impact hub, from, from the investment side and everything, there's, there's just a lot of, um, I mean, it's been already super fascinating this evening, so thank you. But um, we have just a few more last questions. We, <laughs> we, we, we call them a rapid fire question. The, the concept is the first thing that comes to mind, you know, and there's no right or wrong answer, it's just rapid fire. Just whatever comes to your mind is, is the answer. So what's, what's one item that you own that you would never sell? <laughs> I, was, I was thinking a mobile phone, but yeah, that's the first thing that came to, to mind, but I would sell my mobile phone immediately. So yeah. it's a stupid thing that came to my mind. Surfboard? <laughs> yeah, surfboard. Maybe the first, the self-shaped, uh, the, the uh, custom-shaped surfboard that we bought each other is yeah, our first <laughs> boards. Yeah, no, not sell that. What's your most unusual skill? Um, I focus. What's more important, strength, speed, or stamina? Stamina, if I understand it right. I hope. <laughs> uh, which historical figure do you admire? Um, Current or past? Yeah, so it's um, um, Nelson Mandela, um, Barack Obama, and Martin Luther King. And it's interesting that it's all male, like, <laughs> <laughs> once in a life. What's your favorite season of the year? Oh, winter waves. <laughs> <laughs> when was the last time that you tried something new? Um, what, did, what was? I think last week I had some something that I never done. What was it again? I forgot. I forgot. Ah, we went to the um, uh, we went to the tier tier park uh, Zurich on a <laughs> Sunday, which apparently only parents do because we were like one of the only couples there, and we even met another couple, and they were you you and they have kids, and you'd win this year. Like, can you take <laughs> our kids one? So we went for the first time to the tier park nice. uh, Zurich. Uh, cool. <laughs> well, you already answered this one, but team or single founder. Uh, cats or dogs? Both. 
Ah, oh, sorry, dogs. Okay, I said both. I, yeah, that's also an answer. Yeah, no, I, I love animals. I yeah. like animals very much. And Why? I think um, um, always have, always have. Uh, I grew up with like we never had a pet. Maybe that's mm, why. But yeah. our, our neighbors had a, had a dog, and I loved this dog so much. And, nice. Yeah. Wine or beer? Uh, probably beer. Yeah. Uh, or the beats. <laughs> <laughs> and your, the favorite app on your phone? Um, probably my calendar app. <laughs> What's something on your bucket, bucket list? Uh, night train to Lisbon. <laughs> and if you could have the attribute of an animal, what would you choose? Or if you could be an animal, which animal? That is very recent. It came first to my mind now. It is the uh, being able to do the winter schlaf, the winter sleep. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's amazing. If you know, if you know, like there's no food around, or like let's say business is super low, you just go and hi 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 hibernate. Hi hibernate. Yeah. You wake up and let's go. Time is good again. <laughs> no, it was at the tier park. We were. I was contemplating about this, <laughs> this feature. And, uh, just, and I think it's a very rare answer to your question. Probably, so. yeah, just go to sleep for two or three weeks and. Wake up. And <laughs> Thank you so much, Gustav, for joining us tonight and for everything that you shared with us. Really appreciate it. Thank and you it's for very everything valuable. that you're doing with Startup Grind. Honestly, that's really cool for us here. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, David.